This is the story of how the tank has determined the fate of nations in the past and how they will continue to do so in the future. Today's state-of-the-art tank, the Abrams, is a realization of over 4,000 years of armored development. Since first waging war against one another, men have dreamt of armor, a means of shielding vulnerable flesh in bloody battle. That dark dream was first realized by Egyptian and Mesopotamian warriors in 2500 BC with the invention of the chariot. The early attempts at armoring things were to, first of all, to prevent enemy weapons from doing damage to the people who were using the chariots. The second thing was to provide uh, mobility to that armored platform. So you have two things, you've got armor protection and mobility. In 217 BC, Hannibal, one of antiquity's greatest military generals, used armored war elephants to lead the Carthaginians against the Roman Empire. These fearsome beasts not only protected Hannibal's warriors, their mere appearance terrorized opponents. Leonardo da Vinci was the first to foresee modern armor. In the 15th century, he drew these remarkable plans for a portable man fighting vehicle that bore a striking resemblance to the tanks of this century. But the technology required for such a machine would not be realized for over 400 years with the coming of the Industrial Revolution and the war it made possible. World War I. For the first time in history, men possessed mechanized weapons of mass destruction. The uh, enormous amount of artillery and machine gun fire that was present on the battlefield that just decimated soldiers by the thousands. The war would eventually claim over nine million lives. Most perished in trench warfare where soldiers attacked one another in an endless cycle of death usually with nothing to show for it. If an army possessed a weapon capable of crossing the trenches, they could break the deadly stalemate. During the first year of the war, a visionary officer of the British Royal Engineers, Ernest Swinton, saw an American-made vehicle that inspired a radical solution. Swinton had been looking at Caterpillar tractor tracks on artillery gun carriages. Swinton's idea was to put armor on the carriage that would go on those tracks and it could go across the mud and through the trenches and so forth. Old school military leaders in England immediately rejected Swinton's plans for the new age weapon. However, one man championed his vision, Winston Churchill, then the first lord of the British Admiralty. Navy ship designers completed a crude prototype, the Little Willie, in 1915. The project was so classified, workers were told they were building large water cisterns for troops in Egypt. Soon, the new secret weapons were known simply as tanks. Terms such as the hull, the hatches, and the deck reveal the tank's nautical origins and persist even today. By September of 1916, the world's first armored fighting vehicles arrived in France ready for battle. Called the Mark I, the weapon was like nothing seen before or since. The armored behemoth was eight feet tall, 32 feet long, and weighed 28 tons. It was heavily armed with four machine guns and two powerful 57 millimeter naval guns mounted on rotating sponsons. Its 10 millimeter armor protected its crew from most enemy bullets. The Mark I's most brilliant technological achievement was its long tractor treads that enabled the vehicle to do what had previously been impossible. Navigate muddy terrain and cross trenches. But the Mark I was primitive as it was revolutionary. The crew consisted of 11 people, four or five of whom did nothing but run around and oil the engine and try to keep it running. 
And then there was a crew on the gun, the, the Sponsons. It took three or four people to service those weapons. Then there, there were two guys up in the top who apparently gave it some direction. The Mark I was so undependable, 50% broke down after traveling only a few thousand yards. Their cabins were so hot that crewmen often fainted. They were so noisy, communication was impossible. Not long after the Mark I drove onto the battlefields of World War I, the French introduced their own design, the Renault FT-17. Lighter and faster than its British counterpart, it weighed 6.5 tons, had a crew of only two, and achieved a top speed of five miles an hour. One of its most innovative features was a revolving gun turret. The British were looking at a land battleship, so they had large vehicles that were able to cross trenches with ease. The French were looking more at a replacing the cavalry horse, so they're small and more maneuverable and much better for exploitation. On September 15, 1916, tanks entered combat for the first time when 36 British Mark I's crossed the enemy lines on the Western Front. Their mere appearance terrified German infantry. Tanks certainly had an effect on the execution of World War I. They were shocking to the enemy troops. The British tanks were humongous. It must have been uh, like the guys who saw Hannibal coming with the elephants. My God, what is that coming down, coming down the path? The tanks successfully led British troops 3,500 yards into enemy territory. It was one of the most spectacular victories of the war. In response, the Germans later experimented with armor, producing the monstrous A7V. Weighing over 30 tons with a crew of 18, it resembled a large armored box on a tractor chassis and was never used in the war. Meanwhile, hoping to capitalize on their new high-tech weapon, the British began planning the war's largest tank offensive. The battle would deliver one of England's only World War I victories and ultimately determine the future of the tank. The Germans, who had no effective tanks in World War I, would capture British tanks in battle and paint on the Iron Cross. Modern marvels will return in a moment. With the initial success of the Mark I, the British Tank Corps believed the tank was the answer to trench warfare. Hoping for a clear and lasting victory on the Western Front, Allied commanders devised a revolutionary scheme. For the first time in the war, they would use a dense formation of tanks to lead a major offensive. Their target, a previously impregnable sector of the German front near the French village of Cambrai. The plan called for the infantry to follow close behind the tanks to exploit the breakthrough attack. After secretly amassing nearly 400 of the new Mark IV tanks, the Battle of Cambrai began on November 20th, 1917. Within four hours, the tanks had advanced up to four miles, suffering almost no casualties. However, the revolutionary weapon was successful only so far. After the initial drive through enemy lines, British soldiers immediately fell behind, leaving the tanks vulnerable to German artillery and infantry, who knocked them out one by one. They had not provided the forces to follow up and exploit the effect of the breakthrough attack, so the whole thing uh, was kind of a waste of time. They did gain some territory, which the Germans promptly recaptured. And one of the primary armor concepts is uh, tanks work with infantry and they make a great team, either by themselves or much less effective. After the Battle of Cambrai, besieged German leader Kaiser Wilhelm personally inspected several captured Mark IVs. It was now clear that the Allies had gained the upper hand in technology and in the war. It was to be the last time Germany would allow its enemies the same advantage. While the Great War ended in 1918, its use of tanks ignited a debate over how to best deploy the